Years ago, there was a very successful female fighter by the name of Ronda Rousey. She was undefeated and she was all over sports news. She finally encountered her first loss and she told a reporter that in the locker room after the loss, she started to have suicidal thoughts. She'd so identified with being this undefeated fighter that she finally said, if I'm not that, who am I? Welcome to chapter two, self perception and communication. Who are we? So before we can interact with others, we really want to take a look at who we are and how we got there. So again, I want to give you sort of a 10,000 foot view of this chapter and I want you to see some words and concepts and then I hope you'll take those as you apply them to your assignments in this module. Self-concept and self-esteem. You hear self-esteem thrown around a lot, but self-concept is really kind of who I am and esteem is how I feel about that. So we need to know that who we are and how we feel about ourselves affects how we communicate. It affects how we carry ourselves. If we're closed off from the world because we think that it's out to get us, or maybe we just don't think we have anything to offer. It changes our eye contact, our posture, but also something social scientists call the willingness to communicate. It can really prohibit us from asking a question or asking someone out on a date or applying for a job. So let's jump in and look at communication and self-concept you're gonna see a term called reflected appraisal. And oftentimes our appraisal has to do with how we see ourselves in other people. There are significant others and your textbook talks about that. And I'm gonna ask you to really um, think about this and journal about someone who has impacted your life. There are people like teachers or parents or coaches or neighbors who have maybe said something to us that has been positive or maybe negative. I'll tell you a quick story because I'm sure we have lots of positive examples. And when I turned 40 years ago, I, I sat down and made a list of all the people that really mattered to me. You're going to see a video in this module that's really great from the happiness lab about how to hack into your brain chemistry. If you're feeling a little down, you can find someone and tell them just how, how much they've meant to you and how they have affected maybe your self concept and how you see yourself. I made a list of 40 people when I turned 40, specifically women, and I wrote letters to them to tell them. But we also have people who maybe said negative things to us and we carried that with us. When I was younger, uh, I had a relative in my family who would sometimes take me with her daughter to the mall to buy things. And I didn't have a lot and going to the mall and having my mom buy something is not something I experienced ever as a child. And one day I didn't want to hang out with them anymore and I asked if I could just go home and this relative said, it's fine, we know that you only spend time with us because you, we buy you things because your parents are too poor to do that. That internalized in me that I was a poor kid and I carried that with me for a long time. So our self-concept, sort of how we see ourselves can be developed, it also developed by our culture. That has a huge influence on us and then we can fall into this self-fulfilling prophecy where if I say I'm smart, I feel smart, I attempt to do things that would, that would then in turn show the world that I'm smart. But if I feel like I'm an outsider and I specifically avoid people, it can become the self-fulfilling prophecy that's a pretty dangerous cycle. So do we have self-fulfilling prophecies or not? I really want you to think about this as you're looking at people who've influenced your life or said things to you? Did you carry them? Did, did it become sort of the self-fulfilling prophecy? Did it, did it create what I tell my own kids, uh, a playlist in your head? I want you to think about those significant others. You're going to spend some time in this module really expressing gratitude. It can do wonders for your brain chemistry. Lots of happy chemicals. You'll see a video about that. So let's look at what shapes your self-concept. We have this thing, and you're gonna hear a term called mistaken attributions. You may have heard the word attribute, like let's attribute this to that. So if something happens, we can say, well, it's attributed to that. So we have at mistaken attributions. We have sort of this self-serving bias where we see the world to fit a story in our head 
or to feed what we want to be true. We have this crazy thing called the halo effect. It was one of the first papers I wrote in a class like this uh, over 20 years ago. But it's this idea that sometimes we see people and because they look attractive, we assume they're trustworthy or we assume that they are smart. And so based on their appearance, we assign qualities to them. You'll also know that there's the opposite. It's called the horns effect. Okay, this we're going to be quick through this chapter, but I want you to think about privileges and perception. This is a big one. And if you say the word privilege in a class, and if we were to do an activity together, we would do this privilege um, perspective taking activity. We all have some sort of privilege. I once had a, a student and we were doing this activity and I said, uh, what are some privileges you have available to you and, and the perception and some of those can get a little um, mistaken. But we all found something that we could say, gosh, I am really privileged that I, maybe I come from a big family, um, maybe I was, uh, I had access, we live in Houston, to opportunities that other people don't have access to, or maybe I, maybe I grew up with financial resources, um, if you're like me, maybe you didn't, um, or maybe you had a huge family, so when those people got older, you had a network. So the privilege that we have, it can be really tricky, but we re need to recognize that how that changes our perception um, of other people. In this chapter, there's gonna, you're gonna see some terms that fall under this, this section of myths about gendered communication. So we have said that that's a boy thing or that's a girl thing, that's a male thing. And so we kind of categorize people by sex, but that those are becoming a little bit fluid. And I wanna give you an example, specifically of gender assigned things. Hundreds of years ago, people considered pink to be a masculine color, they put male babies in pink outfits and blue to be a feminine color. Now today you would say that's crazy, that's flipped. But when we start to assign those, it becomes a social construct. It says in this area, this is how it is. So if you were to go to Ireland and maybe see men wearing kilt, you would think, why would a man wear a skirt? But in that culture, in that context, that's perfectly acceptable and normal and part of their culture. And so we, we as society sort of put, impose rules that are not fair. Another really great example in, in my house is that I love sports. I have four brothers, I grew up with sports. So if I go to um, a Super Bowl party, I don't want to hang around the snacks and talk about Pinterest, which is stereotyping women, but I want to watch the game and I'm there to watch the game. I don't really want to talk about anything else. So people often will cute, confuse my husband and I and say, oh, they'll ask him about the Rockets or about the Ashers and he'll say, I have no idea, ask my wife. Um, so you're going to see some terms like um, androgynous, undifferentiated. I want you to jump in. You may even choose to use one of those to, write, to do your informative um, speech. But, and then we have this sort of gender matrix. I want you to really look at this section of the chapter. I want you to see, does that make sense? Does that resonate? Have you heard those terms? You're gonna see some of them um, in your assessment or your quiz in this module. Empathy and emotional IQ. Let's jump into it. You've probably heard the term EQ. There's a lot of research that says people that are emotionally intelligent end up being more successful than people who are, have a high IQ or maybe they're great at math or reading but they can't read people. So what does it look like when you're developing who you are and your own communication com uh, competence is to say, how do I have empathy? And how, um, how am I building my emotional IQ? Am I thinking about other people? Am I taking, um, doing perspective taking where I think about what it must be to be like them? Do you have sympathy for those people? Those are not the same. You'll see that in your quiz. Where's my emotional intelligence? You, in your uh, ebook, you can take a fun little survey to see how high is my EQ? Am I as self-aware as I think I am? When I go into rooms, organizations, spaces, am I doing perception checking? So am I asking myself, especially in conflict, am I thinking about what it must be like to be the other person? Am I looking at this from different angles. I tell my students all the time that when you feel like you're in conflict and you know when you're in the middle of a disagreement, it's uncomfortable. But if you lean into the discomfort, there's connection on the other side of that. You just have to tell yourself that you that this person is inviting you to think, to see 
this from their perspective. All right, huge in this chapter. Not only do we develop a self-concept, we develop our self-esteem, but then once we think we have it, we manage it. So once I think I know who I am, I'm trying to manage it. This can get real ugly real fast, especially maybe when you become a college student in your teenage years. Uh, my, I have a young daughter and when she was in middle school, she got glasses, she was so excited. She said, I feel like a nerd on the inside. I want to look like a nerd on the outside. And one day she forgot her book on her way out the door and she panicked and she said, I have to be holding a book. Um, it feels like that's who I am and I have an image to uphold. So her glasses and her book were part of her identity management. We have this perceived self that what we think other people think of us. So if someone may think, um, that you are an athlete or you are rich or you are fun or uh, you're super intelligent. Then you have the self you're presenting to the world. Maybe you present yourself as really confident um, and maybe that's not actually true. So we have a face that we put to the world. Our identity we are managing all the time and that is actual work. So I want you to really look at this part in the chapter because I hope it's freeing to you as you say, what is the identity I'm trying to manage? And at some point, and usually psychologists say about middle age or 40, we start to unravel a little bit and we say, I can't manage this anymore. It's too hard. Um, it's too much work. So we want to really self-monitor and ask ourselves, am I presenting an authentic self? or my presenting a fake self. And that's where social media comes in. And I don't have to go into this for you to know that there are lots of people who have fake social media presence that what they present to the world may be a beautiful family while they're a closet alcoholic, or maybe they post beautiful pictures of themselves, but they feel really insecure. And actually, if you ask them would say, I think I'm so ugly, but I present myself as this beautiful, happy person Identity and social media are really tricky. Social media can boost your self-esteem. If your video goes viral, you feel awesome. If 10,000 people liked your picture, you feel great. But you get to choose whether you want to be genuine or not. And I don't know that we've all figured that out really well. We have to try um, constantly, again, to be um, taking perspective, self-monitoring, and then it can really enhance emotional resilience. If I'm honest, I would tell you that I don't check rate my professor. It's not necessarily social media, but it's a presence out there where people are rating me, whether they like me or they don't. And the reason I don't is because if I saw 10,000 positive comments, that one negative comment would probably keep me up at night. So I want you to think about when you see negative comments, developing emotional resilience means I'm able to function and I'm able to move past those negative comments. Okay, let's wrap this up. Who are we? And how was that formed? And what were the influences involved in that process? And then when we figure out who we are and how we feel about ourselves, how are we presenting it to the world? And is it being perceived the way that we hope to present it? I hope you'll really take some time and dig into um, this module. I hope you'll watch the videos um, that are posted. They're very short, but they're helpful to really see what this looks like played out. I hope you'll sit with the question, who am I? And I hope that as you start to really look at who you are, that you find your self-esteem go up and not down. I hope you'll thank the people in your life, the significant others that have made you who you are in all the, all the best ways. And I hope that even as an online instructor that you would know that I am encouraging you to really look at uh, your humanity, perfect or not perfect, that you don't have to fit and that you can really begin to develop emotional resilience positive self-esteem and that you would say, no, I really do like who I am. Let's be connected to ourselves. Maya Angelou says, and I'll end with this quote, that while we all have this sort of longing to fit in or longing to belong, um, she said, one day I got to the place where 
I belonged everywhere and nowhere because I belong to me. I hope you'll find that to be true.